Hello. Good afternoon, everybody. Bonjour tout le monde. We are considering this next conversation and the two that follow it as a three-part conversation on an aspect of life that has become all too familiar in our cities, the threat of terrorism, the threat of radicalization, and we're going to focus all of these conversations on the specific challenge that that poses to cities, and if there are tools or strategies that cities can harness, trying to figure out how to meet this threat going forward. I have to say, we couldn't have picked a more timely moment for this first in our series of conversations with three of the most authoritative and respected voices researching and writing about the threat of terrorism in the world today. Um, because we gather today, the week after the fall of Raqqa, the self-proclaimed capital of ISIS in Syria, which raises all of these questions relevant to our conversation today, such as, what's the next chapter of ISIS and the terror threat going to look like? Um, are we going to see this much feared, long anticipated flood of fighters returning to cities in Europe and North Africa? Um, what exactly might happen uh, as ISIS loses territory? Will they fall back on something that's worked for them quite well in past, which is attacking cities here in Europe? So to take on some of these questions, welcome to the three of you. Um, and I'm going to let all three of you respond to this. I don't want to spend too long on Raqqa, but I want to just start with what the fallout, what the impact in our cities might be from what happened last week in Syria. Shiraz, do you want to take that on first? Sure. So I think um, when we think of ISIS, when we try to conceptualize it, it's important to understand that ISIS really has held three different forms simultaneously. It has always been a terrorist group, and we've experienced that wave of terrorism in the West, of course, uh, rather acutely in the last few years. It's also been an insurgency, and it remains that as well. Um, and for the last three or four years, it's had this proto-state project where it's attempted to seize land and to govern and to set up an alternative structure away from the traditional state. So the military campaign as it's taking place right now, what we've seen with the fall of Mosul and more recently with the fall of Raqqa, means that ISIS is falling back on it, the two other aspects of its identity, being an insurgency and a terrorist group. So I think, conversely, actually, uh, as much as it's a good thing to push ISIS back, it's a necessary thing to defeat them militarily. In the short to medium term, one of the consequences of that will be an increase in the terrorist threats facing us, particularly here in the West and in Europe especially. Graham, you next. What, what do we make of the Islamic State now that they don't anymore have much of a state to speak of? What will be the impact in our cities? I, would, I think I would echo most of what Shiraz said. I would, would add a couple things. The, the role of Raqqa for um, the Islamic State ha has been um, as a de facto capital, but it's also been a kind of um, geographic fount of inspiration. Mm. It's been the sort of showroom model of what the Islamic State can do in governance, in the creation of a homeland for Muslims worldwide. The absence of that, um, that geographical locus of inspiration, I think, is, is hugely significant. Even though the Islamic State, for over a year now, has been telling its foreign fighters, don't come here, instead stay home and fight there, the fact that there is no longer a place where this dream can be instantiated, can be made physical, I think that, 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 that matters a lot. The, the issue that I think we, we don't quite have the data on, but that's also very important, is uh, the foreign fighters who went there. W are, you know, are they coming back, or did they expect to die in place? And most of what I've seen, most of the people I, I've, I've watched who have gone over there, I think we're expecting to, uh, they, they bought one-way tickets. They wanted to die there, and I think most of them have had their wish fulfilled. So I think that's probably the, the other factor in the, in the fall of Raqqa that we have to watch. So you're less worried about people flooding back? Yes, I, I think that the 40,000 who went over there will not equal anything like 40,000 returning. The ones who do return will be battle-hardened, and that will be very bad. But most of them were hoping to die and didn't want to watch their paradise wrecked. Um, they wanted to be, be dead before that happened. All right, so that sounds like the good news take. Gilles, would you agree? Well, sure, but I would add to that that the, um, there was something more that uh, Raqqa was the place out of which uh, attacks in Europe were coordinated. 
via the social networks, uh, encrypted messenger services, and so on and so forth. And Raqqa played a very important role uh, in this sort of third generation jihadism where you didn't have like, you know, in Al-Qaeda times, it was not a pyramidal system where someone, Bin Laden, Zawahiri or others would assign a target, give orders, train people like they did for 9-11. It was a far more network-based system, but that, that network was functional only because there were two feet, you know, there was the Raqqa foot and the wherever, London, uh, Berlin, Paris, or to lose food. So this is very important because the whole system which made the third generation uh, jihadism functional is now down. And if you follow uh, the conversations on the social networks uh, nowadays for the jihadists, uh, it has changed completely. You know, it's sort of very, uh, they're sort of down. Uh, doomed and say so we, we did something wrong, Allah punished us and uh, so it's unclear what is going to be the next stage but this model if you wish that they had is not is not functional anymore and you said this was a timely moment because of the full Raqqa of course but for those of you who uh, are not familiar with France in this city of Paris uh, we're now starting today the fourth week of the major jihadism trial, the Mera affair. Mohammed Mera was someone who, who killed uh, kids from a Jewish school in Toulouse in March uh, 2012 and also uh, uh, French um, soldiers or military from Muslim descent whom he dubbed apostates. And this was the real, uh, you know, start of this third wave terrorism in Europe. So the coincidence of the two is something, of course, of a defining moment, and the trial shows how the security services at the top were unable to understand the software of this jihadism. They still thought of it using the previous, the Ben Laden system. So this is a lesson to be taken on how, you know, uh, when the police think in a closed box and there's no uh, exchange with civil society, with academia, it does not work. And for the purpose of your conference, because if you take the city as, as the place where it happens, uh, all components of the cities have to, to build together because terrorism in the outskirts or in the banlieues of our big cities, of course, is, is linked to deterior, deter, deteriorated sorry, social conditions and also the attractivity of the Salafi ideology. In order to, to master the, the whole issue, you must have a number of people from different disciplines who get together. And this was one of, the, of our failures, and these are one of the lessons, I believe, that we have to learn, particularly uh, for Myers and for people who are okay. dealing with public policies. You're speaking of failures and lessons that have been learned, and one of the things I wanted to put to this panel in particular is the different ways that different countries, different cities have been taking on the terror threat. Um, you know, we're lucky that we have on stage today somebody who lives in London, somebody from Britain, somebody from the US, somebody from here in France. Three countries that have handled the challenge and the response to terrorism quite differently. This year so far, um, Britain seems to have been hit much harder than France. Uh, you could have said something very different a year or two ago. Let me um, start by asking why you think that is and what are the virtues of the different approaches? Shiraz, do you want to take that one? Well, I think the UK has uh, tried to pioneer, at least for, for several years now, this idea of having a soft power aspect, uh, which is delivered through local communities. It's delivered through partnerships on the ground. It's known as the Prevent Program, and it sits alongside uh, the more hard-edged hard traditional policing aspects of counter-terrorism work. Now, uh, the PREVENT program uh, in the UK, at least, is a, is a contentious piece of uh, uh, the CT framework. It sits um, in a number of ways that it's quite contestable as to how successful it is, who will implement it. But that has been one of the, the real challenges for local communities in terms of how do you get out there, how do you begin to put some of these things through. And actually, one of the, the challenges of it is that there are lots of things we want in our cities and our communities for their own sakes. So more cohesive communities, more integrated communities. Um, these are good things in and of themselves. But when you 
bring the security an angle to them or you securitize them, they become inherently more contentious and there's a lot more pushback against them. So that's been one of the, the real struggles we've had in the UK in terms of getting that message uh, uh, out there and in terms of trying to build a capacity within those very communities that you're trying to reach in the Does first London place. feel different, by the way, than it would have a year ago? I mean, is, do you see a more active security presence given the, what are we, at, half a dozen attacks in Britain this year? Yes. Uh, I mean, the UK is not like the United States. We don't have uh, all of our police armed. In fact, mm -hmm. guns are a very uh, rare thing to see in the UK. We, of course, have very strict gun laws as well, more generally. So the idea that you now have a much more visible uh, armed response policing in the UK, particularly around key sites, of course, around Parliament, yeah. at the major airports at Heathrow, at um, Buckingham Palace, these types of key areas. Um, it's become part and parcel of everyday life now. The public have, uh, from being in an initial state of being quite alarmed by seeing it, now increasingly feeling reassured by it. We've seen the effectiveness of having these very highly trained uh, officers who are able to stop attacks very, very quickly. So there has been a shift in that sense, but there's also, of course, and I don't think it's the UK's exception on this, there's been a rise in social tension as a result of these types of attacks that we've seen uh, as well. And so you tend to get this reciprocal radicalization taking place between polar extremes where one side is feeding off the anger and hatred of the other. Gilles, uh, so briefly, do you want to take this on? What do you think accounts for Paris? I'm looking around for wood to knock on, but knock on wood having a, a quieter year this year than some other cities. Well, you know, unfortunately, in the, in the countdown, we're still uh, uh, number one because we had 239 people who were killed in a year and a half, which is, of course, a lot, which is far more than what happened in Britain this year in Germany. But nevertheless, for more than a year now, uh, the French police was able to, to nip all the new attacks in the bud. And uh, this was due to two things, to also to the exhaustion of this network-based model, because, you know, uh, they had to rely on people who are not trained, who used the opportunities, who were lucky at times, but who were not. For instance, in the, the last attempt to, to have a major blow close to Notre Dame of September 4th of 2016, um, they manipulated uh, five or six young uh, women who had no idea of how to, you know, to, to inflame, to, to set ablaze a, a blanket or something, so it, they did not explode. And then uh, the, the, the guys who engineered that were blamed by uh, their handlers in Raqqa because they had exposed the modesty of sisters and so on and so forth. So, you know, the contradictions within this system were uh, very important and they could not last very long as opposed to the Ben Laden model that was far more structured. Another thing, of course, the difference between the, the French and the, and the British model is that in Britain, um, so, so much more has been given to the communities, quote unquote, so as to police the situation. A has less been centralized from, Farmed out, situation. absolutely. Like, and, uh, you know, in the in the 1990s, we in Paris dubbed London Londonistan because they had uh, brought all and uh, sundry from, uh, you know, guys with biggest beards than Shiraz, <laughs> uh, from all over the, the world. And uh, they were all there, all the, the disciples of Ben Laden, of Islamic Jihad, whatever. They were all in London and the British authorities thought that as they were there, this sort of guaranteed that Britain would be a sanctuary, that nothing would happen which ultimately proved wrong because there was the attack in, on uh, uh, July of uh, 2005 and so on and so forth. The French, on the contrary, had a much more um, uh, controlled and centralized system, which when they, when they missed uh, the change in the terrorism software, you know, because of the centralized community, and this trial now shows it very well, the local people at the city level in, in Toulouse had understood who was doing that. But the top people would say no, and it did not work, and this is how we got it. Now they have understood that better. And on the long run, I would rather say that a centralized uh, security system is better because they can plan ahead. And in the, in the, in the battle between the, the network jihadism and the centralized, centralized state, the first battle may be won by the network people because they go under the radar, but they, they can't last, you know. So these are maybe also 
f food, this is food for thought because we haven't yet uh, uh, come over with that, but this is part of the other debate that we're having now on both Graham, sides of the channel. Can we jump in with the U.S. perspective here? Yeah, so the, the United States, I, I think, uh, the differences between the, the problems that the United States faces in this field and the ones that, say, the U.K. or France does is instructive. Um, we, we almost have a kind of bimodal operation for re recruitment where in the UK, in France, there is uh, a whole host of systemic, community-based issues. There are communities from which recruits will come. There are perhaps even institutions like mosques that, that or, uh, or um, brotherhoods, associations, that will contribute um, recruits to the Islamic State. In the United States, that's pretty much not the case. Um, and instead, we're looking at idiosyncratic cases, ones and twos, occasionally clusters. There's five fighters known to have gone from Plano, Texas. It's not as if the, there is a community in Plano, Texas that has caused, that has systemic issues that have, have provoked five people to travel to, to Raqqa. It's simply that there are one or two people who are extremely persuasive to a few gullible others. So I think the United States um, mode, this idiosyncratic mode, is, is actually what we see in, in most of the world. So in Japan, um, it's, it's of course not going to be a community. In fact, the two people I could name who are from Japan who have gone to, to ISIS territory are both university professors. Mm. They, they have gone and have knew, known each other. So I, I think it, what, we, what we need to, to, to notice about what can be done from the American perspective and, say, from the Japanese perspective, it's much more intelligence-based mapping of networks, interdiction, and then finally, a matter of foreign policy. I mentioned at the beginning that the fall of Raqqa is significant in part because it deprives people of the inspiration of this showroom model of what a caliphate can be. That, I think, actually might make an effect on, say, someone who is alone in his basement in Colorado, in California, and thinking about what he wants to die for. If he sees that this, this caliphate is just about kaput, then he might look for a different source of inspiration. All right. We're going to have time for one question, I think, from our audience. Uh, so let me uh, get mics out there and see if we're going to have time for one. Hello. Um, if you could tell us your name and if you have an affiliation. You yes, want to share. Uh, Amy LeMay. I'm the Night Czar of London. Uh, my question really uh, is to Graham and to um, um, the others as well, but mainly Graham. Uh, just the definition of terrorism. And I think in London, you know, we've certainly uh, had to grapple with the idea that we have quote unquote homegrown terrorists as well. Um, and I'm wondering what uh, the feeling is in the United States around terrorism and say, for example, the recent incident that happened, the terrible incident in Las Vegas, and the perceptions of terrorism, really, where people are coming from and whether America can really accept the idea of homegrown terrorism in the way that we've had to accept that in the UK. Thank you. So describing, I mean, we started with Raqqa, and that's at one end of the spectrum, and then we see what happened in Las Vegas two weeks ago, a very different thing. The, the, the threat of homegrown terrorism and, and where radicalization of that kind is coming from, what do we think? I, I think the, the caution that has been um, deployed in not describing Las Vegas as a terrorist act is, is well placed. I mean. Just for definitional purposes, I tend to use a fairly accepted definition of terrorism, which requires a political motive. And so far, we just don't have that in the case of Las Vegas. We have no motive of any kind in Las Vegas. What it Vegas, demonstrates yeah. is just that there are horrible things that aren't terrorism. Um, and to, to, I think to, to conflate that with a terrorist threat is, is probably a mistake. But it's also a mistake, of course, to, uh, to ignore the systemic issues that have made it possible for an individual to kill. 50 odd people um, using apparently his own, you know, his credit card and, and nothing else. Quick rejoinder from either of you. <laughs> um, Last word, sure eyes. You know, the, this aspect of, you know, I think uh, I'd agree with Graham, terrorism does need to have some sort of political ideological component to it to have uh, uh, meaning. And uh, we don't have that in the case uh, uh, of Las Vegas at this moment in time. But, um, this aspect of people being radicalized at home, being part of uh, communities at home, 
is a phenomenon we've seen since September the 11th. It's just the fact that uh, Islamic State has been far more successful in mobilizing people on a larger scale, um, which comes back to the first points that uh, were, were being made by both uh, Professor Capel and Graham, that uh, you know, the, the power of Raqqa in terms of this sort of centerpiece that could be used to inspire others was extremely uh, potent in the sense of mobilizing people who felt that here is a caliphate, it's tangible, it's real, it's available in my lifetime, I need to listen to what its leader is telling me to do. So the, the fall of that city is very important, even in terms of having a dampening effect on uh, the so-called homegrown radicals. Shiraz, Graham, Jill, thank you all very much. Pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.